And we pray that we know that there's more. We know that there's more that we need to tap into. As we look at the life of those two men in 1 Kings chapter 14, you have examples, use them as examples of characteristics you do not want us to have. The way these things are ingrained in our lives, we want you to approve them in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us, O oh Lord, to be Christians that are sincere, straightforward, and honest in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you, Lord, because we believe you've answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, we pray as we look through your word, the Holy Spirit, your spirit, you send your spirit down to interpret your word and apply it to our hearts in such a way that is strong, that enough to propel action in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now we're going back to 1 Kings chapter 14. As you look at 1 Kings chapter 14, you have two kings, two men. And you see this, even though they are different, you see a similarity that the Bible has brought out in this, car, in this chapter about them, in their actions. So as you look at them, you see something that Jeroboam did and something that Rehoboam did. And there's a similarity between it. So we're going to go back and pick this apart. And the title we're looking at today is The Danger of Cover-Up in the life of a Christian. The danger of cover up in the life of a Christian. Now let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 14 from verse one. At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself, that thou be not known unto the wife, to be the wife of Jeroboam, and get thee to Shiloh, and behold, Ahijah the prophet, which told me that I should be king, I should be king over the people. There is Ahijah the prophet, which told me that I should be king over the people. I take thee, I take with thee ten loaves and cracknels. Cracknels are like crumbly, uh, it's like biscuits, you understand? And a cruise of honey, and go to him, and he shall tell thee what shall become of the child. And Jeroboam's wife did so. Now, as you look at this, you see Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, became sick. Jeroboam was a king, but even kings have trouble common to men. His sick son troubled him and prompted him to seek the help of a prophet. And as you look at this, he knew the prophet. So when you look at Jeroboam's sin, that's why the Bible elevates his sin so high. Because it wasn't a sin of ignorance. He knew. It was a sin against knowledge. He knew. He knew the right way. He knew what, what he was doing it was wrong. When he's in a tough corner, he knew what to do because you'll find out that there's a pattern in the life of Jeroboam. When things are tough, the, the prophets of the idols uh, that he has set up, he knows they cannot do it. He will turn to the true prophet. He did it in the previous chapter. When he, uh, the prophet came from Bethlehem, Judah, and he says, this is the prophecy. And he said, lay your hand upon him and take him. And then his hand withered up as he stretched it out. He couldn't pull it back in. And then he told the prophet, he said, pray for me. His own prophets could not do that. Now, similarly, he's in this situation where he's tried, probably, medicine, he's tried his own men, and they could not do anything. And now he says, go to Ahijah. Ahijah was the one who told him that you are going to be king, even when he was a servant. So Ahijah was there. Now, this man, Jeroboam, has made a lot of terrible things. You will see that as we go back, let's go back to a few chapters. If we go back to chapter uh, 12, if you go back to chapter 12, From verse 26, <clears throat> and Jeroboam said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. That was a supposition, the danger of presumption, of supposition. 
God gave him the kingdom. He says, well, but the people need to worship in Jerusalem, which is not in my kingdom. It's in the kingdom of Solomon's son. So if the people are going back there, then after a while, they will reject. But look at what he says. And in verse 27, and if these people go up to the sanctuary sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of the people turn again to, unto the Lord, even to Rehoboam, the king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam. So it's all very selfish. It's not that for the benefit of the people, although you see what it's going to tell the people. So when people tell you something, you have to watch out because it was, it was, it was his own fear that if they go back, oh, they will, that man, they will say, because he's, a, he's from the royal family. Can you see some inferiority complex coming in, some imposter syndrome coming in to this situation? That even though I'm a king, maybe I'm not really a king, and I'm just here for a while, and the people, you know, will turn back and go to that person, and they will kill me. It's all about himself. So in verse 28, the king took counsel, I wonder who was the person that the people that counseled them. They have their own judgment. And he made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you. Look at what he says. It's too much for you to go to Jerusalem. I'm considerate of you. Look at the journey. Look at the expensive. Look at the stress. Look at the time it will take. He didn't say it's because I'm afraid they will kill me. He said, Because of you. He says, Now behold thy gods. This is the greatest sacrilege. He said, by who thy God's O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. That is a big sacrilege. Well, who brought thee out of the land of Egypt? It's God. And he said, look at this golden calf. This is the one that brought you out of the land of Egypt. He himself was familiar with the ways of Egypt because that's where he ran to when Solomon was trying to catch him. He ran there. He stayed there for a while, but he's not supposed to learn their ways and import their ways into this place. Now, you wonder in all the, in this situation, where is the trust in God? Why can't he, um, why can't he ask Ahijah? So Ahijah, look at the situation here. The kingdom has been split. You said I should take this 10 part on the top. These people take two parts at the bottom, but the temple is in that place. So Ahijah, how shall these things be? That's what God expects of us. When the angel came to Mary, I said, you are going to have a child. She says, I said, but how shall this things be? How is, going to, how is it going to happen? God that says it's going to happen, he knows how he's going to make it happen. So he never, appointed, he never consulted anybody. He took counsel from the wrong people, people. He didn't take counsel from Ahijah. But now he's coming back to Ahijah, having abandoned him for many years, and he's now saying, I need help. But you see the type of help he needs. Now, he told his wife, he said, disguise yourself, disguise yourself, and go to this man. Now, the commentary on here is, <coughs> excuse me, how foolish. Now, think about it. There was a veil that actually there are two veils. There's a veil a lesser one and a greater one. He said, put on a veil, disguise yourself, and go to the man, of, go, the man of God. And I know that the man of God can see through the veil into the future. So the man who can see through the veil in, from the present into the future, I tell you what is going to happen to your child. You think that he's not able to see through this veil you put on your face to disguise yourself? Isn't that foolish? You know that he can see. You know he can see through the veil into the future. Whatever disguise you put on, if there's whatever is clouding the future, he can see it. So whatever you are, is clouding your appearance, will you not see it? Isn't that utterly foolish? You know, and there are people like that today. There are people that will come and want to disguise themselves, and and they still want the prophets the preacher, the man of God, or the prophetess, to tell them the future, and they come with disguise, they come with cover up, and they still expect, this. isn't that foolish? You, the person you feel that you know he has the gift to be able to tell you the future, to be, tell you 
the will of God in a matter. Is he not able to see through that disguise? At the end of the day, you know what it is? It's tempting God. Because it's not about the person. It's about God. Because you're saying, God, you know, you cannot see. You cannot reveal. I know you can reveal. So it's not a, a sin of ignorance. I know you can reveal the future. But you cannot reveal to this person that I'm approaching the truth about this matter that I'm saying. How can somebody come and say, pray for me? And you come with disguise. I think it's going to work. You know, that's the way people behave nowadays. They just want to say, all I want is healing. All I want is this miracle. But you can't see my life. You can't see my life. You don't know my, I will, I will hide my life. I will disguise myself as I'm coming to you. So that you will not be able to, see, but I'll, you'll be able to pray for me. And then I'll be able to get a miracle. How do you think that miracle is going to happen? You know, for this man, judgment came. And I pray for you, judgment will not come in Jesus' name. He thought he was going to get, you know, foretelling about the future. But rather that he got a very firm message of judgment. And let us not tempt God. You might say, well, this is Old Testament. How about New Testament? <clears throat> Ananias and Sapphira came. They said, this man, he cannot see. The thing with this, just, just outside the door before we came in, he cannot hear. And you know what Peter said? He said, you've, you have, you've, you've, not lied again. you've lied to the Holy Spirit. And this is the judgment that is coming to you. So my brother, let us fear God and let us throw away all this cover up that we're doing. Just covering ourselves up and pretend, put on a disguise when we're coming to church. And you know, raising up our hand and thinking that, you know, nobody can see. That God will just, we can deceive God and God will just give, give us that blessing that we are asking for. It's not so, let us not tempt the, the Lord. <clears throat> so, look at what he says. He says, He will tell you what will become of the child. Now, there's something that you must see here. You see, what did uh, Jeroboam tell his wife? He said, Arise, I pray thee, disguise thyself, that thou be not known to the wife, to be the wife of Jeroboam, and get thee to Shiloh. <clears throat> Behold, there's Ahijah the prophet, which told me that I should be king over the people, and take with thee ten loaves and cracknels and a cruise of honey. That's part of the disguise, by the way. That's part of the disguise. Because he says, disguise yourself, so you will not be known to be the wife of the king. So the type of presence she's going to bring is, you know, this is a king, he's a rich man, but look at what he's asking her to bring. So she's disguising as just a normal person, like a poor woman. He says, take 10 loaves of bread from a king. And then take biscuits from a king. And then take a bottle of honey. Can you see? It's part of the disguise, isn't it? So that to deceive that, they'll think that she's just like a, one of those market women. Yeah. One of those traders. But look at it. Now look at his request. His request is not even that, please tell him to plead to, with God on behalf of the child so that the child will not die. No, he's just saying, go to him, let him tell you what is going to happen to this child. So you see, he's using the man of God like a, like a fortune teller. You know what the fortune tellers, the people that read palm, the people that say, that's what he's using it for. Just go to him. Let him just tell us our fortune. Well, let's just tell us what is going to happen in the future. You know, that's how people, what, what people want. They don't want, they don't want anything. They just say, that you, and you're using the man of God like that, that just go to him and let us tell us. If, is, there's nothing here. There's no request for prayer. There's there's no, the wife is not praying. There's no request that please tell the prophet to pray. It's just that let him press the button and let God, tell. you can see how much Jeroboam himself despised the Lord. How he despised, how, what, what, the type of image he has in his mind of who the Lord is. You know, like a, all of these um, gods, one of these deities that, you know, just press and he would let him just tell you the future. And lo and behold, that is what happened. Now, as you shift, you begin to see there's no, there's things that are missing here. You know, there's nothing about, oh, could this be God's judgment? Could this be the hand of God? Could this be God wanting to catch my attention? 
Is there anything that I'm doing that is wrong, that is making this child fall sick? There's nothing about, there's no soul searching, nothing. There's no trying to correct his ways. It's just that, go and find out what is going to happen to this child and use God for that and go through the man of God. So nothing, no soul search, no soul searching. Now to begin to shift the focus for a while, shift the focus to Jeroboam's wife. And then you begin to see a few things. Now this woman, look at uh, verse four. And Jeroboam's wife did what? Did so. And she did what? She arose and she went to Shiloh. She went to Shiloh. You know, there's some women like that. There's nothing like my husband. This errand you are sending me, don't you think, why can't, why can't we do it this way? Can't, don't you think this, she's the mother of the child. Don't you, my husband, it could be, you know, all this serving idols. You know, the other day, you were, oh, you were, you were sacrificing before idol. And God sent somebody to warn you from afar. And you said, when your hand with her, you said, pray for me. And you didn't change since that time. My husband, let us change our, even if I'm going to go to the prophet, let me go and tell him that we are changed people. We're not the same type of people as before. We, have, we know what we have done wrong. So I, and let us ask, why are you asking him to know the future? So what if he said the child is going to die? So you want me to now bring that news back to tell you that the child is going to die? There was no conversation with her husband at all. She just arose as he said it to her. She put on her disguise. She went to the place. And when she got there also, there's no initiative. And even though the king said that I'm the mother of this child, so I will fill in the gap. I will fall down on my knees, fall down on my face. And I said, please, prophet, how can we do this matter so that my child will not die? What are we going to do about Please tell us. You might say, well, she's a woman. Is Abigail not a woman in the Bible? That she used her wisdom to save her family from destruction that was coming. She said, if I rely on the man, all of us are going to be killed here. She said, no. She, she took it. She didn't even tell her husband. She took it. She went to go and plead for the life of her family. And when she came back, she didn't say anything to him. And he was just drunk. She left him like that. But she has saved his life. I pray, women, your wisdom will save your life. <clears throat> it will save the life of your children. It will save the life of your husband in Jesus. A wise woman builds her family, isn't it? Isn't it? But a foolish is just very passive. This woman, I wonder. And when she got there, you know, before she got there, then, now you even say, you, always, you shouldn't have even bothered because all this is guys, because the prophet is even blind because of age. So even if you haven't put on disguise, he wouldn't have seen you. But there's a God. Amen. Before she got there, God have told him. He says, the, the wife of Jeroboam is coming. And she's coming to ask. He told him specifically, it's because of her son she's coming. This and this is this what, what you're going to tell her. So when she get there, he said, welcome. He just heard her footstep. He said, welcome, the wife of Jeroboam. Come in. She was surprised. I said, he began to tell her things. Now here you begin to see how God operates. And please, this is where you need to listen very carefully. Young people upstairs, you need to listen very carefully. Listen carefully to lead to what God told her, what uh, the prophet told her, what God told the prophet to tell her. In verse 7, he says, Go tell Jeroboam thy husband. Thus said the Lord God of Israel, for as much as I exalted thee. Now, what is God doing here? God is giving them the reason why the judgment is going to come. God was specific about what he was unhappy about. You know that people, maybe they are young in the Lord, maybe they are young in age. If you are like that, listen carefully to me. You just feel, I just feel that God is unhappy with me. I just feel God is happy with me. I say, what is God unhappy about? And you cannot tell me. But I just have that feeling. You know, God is not happy with me. I'm not good enough. I'm not good. What is God not happy about? Because the way God operates is that God will be specific. He will tell you, you know, how can somebody, your parent, is, your dad is not happy, not happy with you. And your dad doesn't tell you what he's not happy about. You just know that, that, if, that if you're that type of dad, you also need to change. That they just know that he's in a mood. 
what is in a mood about what have we done to make this man unhappy? Nobody knows what we've done in this house. We just know that it's his bad day. He's also happy with them. We didn't even know what we did. We, so if we don't know what we did wrong, how can we fix it? Well, God, you see, God is not like that. You see what God is going to tell her? God he says, I exalted, I exalted your husband. I tell your husband, I exalted your husband. And I made him prince. And I tore the kingdom away from the house of David. I gave it to him. He said, but he's not been like David. Why is he not like David? Oh, you might say David, he, he slept with another man's wife. He killed the husband. David never turned away from God. David did not, never, never turned away from God. He never, David, go and erect an, an altar for somebody. No, David loves his Lord ultimately. He's the one who wrote all these Psalms. And when God showed that, I'm not happy. The same way, what God did for A, he did for B. What God did for David, he was specific with David. When he sent Nathan to him in the second Samuel chapter 12, Nathan told him the parable like that. And he said, oh, somebody took another person's sheep. It's a wife he's talking about. It's not sheep. And he has many himself, but he took another person's and he killed it. So David said, oh, that person you must die. And he said, you are the man. He said, the message came home. God is telling David specifically what I'm not happy about. You took another man's wife and you killed the man. And you have many wives yourself. So can you see the way God operates? God will tell you what he's not happy about. If anyone is hearing me today, I just know that, hey, I'm just, I know that God is not happy with me. God is not happy with me. But you cannot say, then it is the devil. It is, it's called the accuser of the brethren. He's accusing you. And some of us have been through that stage as young converts. You just know that, you know, God is not happy with me. Too. But what is he not happy? What have you done wrong? I cannot even say. It doesn't just happen to young people. I met an old man. This man is in his 70s. He rang me up, found a number of the church, rang me up. I won't be going to talk. We talked, first I would, maybe two hours. We've talked for four hours before on the phone. Just for the phone will call, we'll call again. What we're talking about this man, it's a, it's a white man. You know, an elder, a Christian. He says, you know, I just have that feeling that I've committed your pardonable sin. I said, what did you do wrong? He cannot tell me. I said, this is the accuser of the brethren. What did you do? I just said, that voice is just whispering to his ear that you have committed your pardonable sin. What, what sin do you commit? When did you commit it? What happened? He cannot tell me. Is the accuser of the brethren. And every day he wakes up, it's like a cloud of depression is upon him. So if you are there, you need to shake it off. Amen. The Bible says, you shall know the truth. And what? The truth shall make you free. God deliver this old brother. And God will deliver you. But it comes by you shaking off. If you listen to lies, lies will affect you. So if you are here, you're saying, I don't have assurance of salvation. I don't know whether I really say, have you given your life to Christ? Do you confess your sins? Do you ask him to forgive you? Have you relinquished your sins? Do you decide not to do all those things? Yes, pastor, yes. But, I didn't, they, they, but something is just telling me I'm not saved. You know, the problem is that you are relying on feelings and God has never given you any assurance that your feelings will be correct. So, you trust your feelings more than you trust the word of God. If God says in his word, do this, do this, and I will do this. And then you've done this, done this, and you say, hey, God, I'm not sure if God has done this. It's lack of faith. You are trusting your feelings more than you are trusting the word of God. So our feelings will go up and down. Take your faith from your feeling and put your faith in the word of God. Amen. Amen. So God is specifically here. Look at it. He said, you have not been like my servant David in verse 8. Who kept my commandment and followed me with all his heart to do only that was right in my eyes, but thou hast done evil above all that were before thee. Amen. Thou has gone and made the other God. Can you see how God is specific? Amen. Thank you. Can you see how God is specific here? He says you have done evil more than everybody. He didn't stop there. You know, so for some people, they say, yes, I think people have done it. What is, what is the evil you have done? God is specific here. God is telling him, you have gone and made other gods, yes or no. You have made molten images, yes or no. 
to provoke me with anger and to cast me behind thy back. Contempt of the Lord. And then now God is now going to tell him what he's going to do. Therefore, behold, I will bring evil on the house of Jeroboam. I will cut off from Jeroboam him that peace against what that's all mills. And that him that is shut up and left in Israel, even the ones that go and hide, I will find them. And like a brother is explaining, I will clean them like filth. And somebody cleans filth away. <clears throat> him that died of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat. And him that died in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. For the Lord has spoken. And arise thou therefore and get to thy own house. And when thy food shall enter the city, the child shall die. Now God forbid, if you are the woman, what would you do? Ah, please, thank you, my sister. He's told him that the moment your foot step on the threshold of your house, that is the moment your child is going to die. I know what the woman did. Look at the next verse. Look at not the next verse. Let me show you the verse. Look at verse 17. And what did Jeroboam's wife do? Jeroboam's wife arose. The old man said, go to Shiloh. She arose, she went. The prophet has given all these bad news. The woman just arose, she carried her hand back, and she went back. And they have told her that the woman your foot is going to step there. I said, what a woman. Our brothers, I pray we don't marry such women in Jesus' name. Women that will not put any, there, there's nothing they will add. Judgment of God is coming down upon the whole family. They, they cannot do anything. She just took that message. She took it back to her husband like that, just like that. I'm saying, women, God, you see, God has made women to plead. Women are very good on their knees. They can easily fall down. A man is not good at falling down on his knees, but a woman is good at falling down on her knees. Do you understand what I'm saying? God has made women to be able to plead. When the man will say, hey, I'm not going to, the women are very good at pleading. So this woman, nothing. She didn't use her initiative when she was going there. The prophet just said, she didn't even open her mouth. In fact, the whole chapter, I'm not, I'm not seeing where this woman opened her mouth, either with her husband or with the prophet. She didn't open her mouth throughout, but that lack of opening her mouth cost her her son. So nothing is changing here. She, she, didn't input, she didn't have any positive input into this matter. So what we're teaching us is, sisters, don't say I'm a woman. God has given you knees. You are, you're very good at following. You're very good at crying. You're very good at praying. You're very good at saying, please, don't let it happen. And it's your, you know, you're very passionate about your children. So even when the, the things the man cannot say, be the Abigail that be, to be the one that will say, look, this thing is not going to happen. Even nobody told Abigail that trouble is coming. She, she knew that trouble was coming. She knew that her husband was in danger. Why? Because of the, the things her husband has done. And she know there's going to be revenge and retaliation coming on the way. And what she did, she quickly, very, I love that woman. She very quickly prepared something. She prepared present. She packed it all. She said, put it on the moon. Go ahead of me. Go ahead of me. I'm coming behind. And then she got to David. She knew that this man, let's give him food. <laughs> a hungry man is an angry man. So give him hot soup and everything. And when you, see, when you smell it, you say, his anger is coming down. <laughs> you say, praise the Lord. No wonder why David said, after her husband died, he said, please, that woman, go and bring her for me. <laughs> because if danger is coming to me as well, she's a wise woman. Amen. So this woman, she just took, she just ran and she just went back like that. Look at it. She just, just took it and went back, just the same way. I pray we'll not be like that in Jesus' name. So, Jeroboam, there are things that are missing here. You see, there's no, so this is a less, this is a message to people that want change, but they don't want, um, they don't want correction. They don't want to change anything. That, and the, the church is full of such people on a Sunday like this. They don't want any correction about their life. They don't want any change. Don't tell me about, just tell me that God is going to bless me. Change is coming my way, amen, shout hallelujah, and all that kind of thing. Prophet, just tell me what is going to happen. If I go on this journey, will I be safe? Will I get there safely? If you say I will not get there safely, I will not travel, I will stay. But if you say I will get there safely, I will come buy my ticket. They just want, but they, will, they don't want anyone to say, you are living with another man's husband. You are living with another man's wife. 
you are, you are sleeping, even you going to go and sleep around, even before coming to church, I'm putting on this garment, you are putting on. They don't want anyone to tell them anything about their life. They just want to use God like this bingo, you know, this machine. Press it, uh, you know, like the uh, vending machine. Press the number, press the button, the thing come down. That's all they want. And such people, it, it, will, it backfires big time. It backfires big time on them. So I pray we will not be like that in Jesus' name. Amen. Same way, you want, if you are the type that gives prayer requests, pray for this, I pray for that. But you see, that's why in deep life we're teaching ministry. We're not primarily a prayer ministry. We pray, but we don't pray as much as some other ministries. You know why? Because prevention is better than cure. The Bible says we the prof, the priests in the Old Testament were supposed to be teachers. So not that people just come and say, priest, pray for me, offer sacrifice for me, pray for me because I've done something again. The priests and the Levites, they had the responsibility to teach. They were the custodians of the word of God. Why? Because prevention is better than cure. Teach the people the right and the wrong so that they will not go and do things that, you know, the wrath of God will come down. And if they make mistakes, then you can pray for them. But well, people don't want that today. They just want, so if you're that type, you know, you just want pray for this and pray for that. But when the word is going on, you tune your ears off. Or maybe the Bible study, you are not nowhere to be found. But if they call prayer meeting, wherever the prayer meeting is, you will go there. If they say miracles happen, you run there. But when teaching is happening, you will not, you, you, you don't have time for it. Then it is not a very good place to be. So at this point, we want to look at something. We want to look at this disguising, this whole pre uh, pretending. You see, when you say, pre I, was, uh, I was curious when the Bible says, when he told his wife to disguise herself, <clears throat> when you look at that word disguise, what it means is this. It's a word that means double yourself. So create another copy of yourself. And they're not like, it's not like a clone. It's not like this is exactly like that. Create another version of yourself, you know, and make that version up to be something that is false. It means pretending to be something else that you are not, or to be pretending to be somebody else that you are not. That's what it means. And you have many, you have a lot of it in the Bible. Now, I'll give you a few examples. You have Jeroboam's wife in 4 Kings chapter 14, verse 5 and verse 6. Then you have Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. You may say, well, they didn't put on physical marks, but it's a disguise. Disguise yourself to be this pious couple that, you know, they've done everything, they've sold all, and this is everything that they are bringing where it's a lie. So it's a disguise. So people disguise themselves and they want to appear hear like people that they know. And you say, why would people do this? Oh, they want, for, for in Jeroboam's wife's case, she wanted to get a blessing that she knew that she was not qualified for. And she didn't even want to qualify for it. She didn't want to go through the hard work of making amends and qualifying for it. She just wanted to get, so as if she's just like a market woman or a trader or just an innocent woman somewhere. Then, for an analysis of her, you can write it down, Acts chapter 5, from verse 1 to verse, from verse 1 to verse 10. What did they want? Oh, they sold their land. Nobody told them to sell it. And then they brought parts and they pretended as if it was all. Why? Because they wanted that honor and that praise and that recognition. Without they, You see, they wanted something without paying for it. The Jeroboam's wife, she wanted something without paying for it, without going through the all the rigmaro or the hard work, the rigor of repenting and confessing and repenting and throwing away the idols and saying, no, this idol that we have been serving, now my child is about to die. We are not serving you anymore. We're turning back to God. And please, God, have mercy for us. She didn't want to go through all that, but she just wanted the quick thing. And also, so far, they wanted that honor. You know that people like that, they pretend, they want honor without having to go through the hard route of paying, you know, of being honorable people. They just want that respect and then they disguise themselves. You know, they just put on something on the outside when the inside has not changed. 
There's another woman here in Second Samuel chapter 14. She also, she disguised herself. Second Samuel chapter 14, from verse two. And Joab sent to Tekoa and fetched thence a wise woman and said unto her, pretty, feign thyself, pretend thyself to be a mourner. She was not a mourner. Pretend thyself to be a mourner and put on mourning apparel and anoint thyself with oil and be as a woman that has long time mourned for the dead. And she just pretended like that. It was a drama, isn't it? All this disguise is drama. What Jerobo's wife was doing is drama. Another sense of is drama. This is another drama. He says, pretend as if you've just lost somebody that is very dear to you and go to If somebody said you're this assignment, no matter how much they pay you, please do not go. Tell somebody you do not go. Ah, it's dangerous. David, the man of God. David, the prophet. David, who can see things. The man after God's will have. Uh, nothing's going to happen to that one. And she said, you promise? I said, I promise. And then she said, ah, and what you, are, what you said to me, do it for yourself also. And he said, why? It's Absalom. Absalom killed his brother. And you've lost that one. Now, the people want to kill Absalom, so you lose the two of them. I said, David said, it's the hand of Jew, I'm not in this one. You know, this is a dangerous assignment. You know why? You go into the presence of God and you are lying. It's dangerous. It's very dangerous. You know, some people will lie. You know, you say, how do people do this? Let me tell you. Some people, by venture, they want to get, they want to test the power of God. Imagine if somebody say, hey, um, man, of, man of God, uh, uh, they'll say they have cancer. They don't have cancer. They just want to see if the man of God can see. They want to test his ability to see to the future and see to the spiritual realm. They have cancer. I don't come with the cook a story of, oh, I lost my wife, I lost my husband. It's a lie. You know, it's dangerous because life and death are where in the power of the tongue. Nobody said it. You are the one who said it. Your child is alive. You say you lost your child. Uh, your husband, and you go and tell a lie. You don't have cancer, you say you have cancer with your mouth. You know, some of those people, they eventually get that cancer because they said it with their mouth. So this woman, she disguised also. Why? Because Joab was behind it. He wanted to force David into bringing Absalom back. I didn't want to go directly. So he said this woman should pretend. Another one is in Genesis chapter 27, verse 22. That one is Jacob. Jacob disguised himself as who? As Esau. He disguised himself. Why? Because he wanted to get the blessing that he, was, was, he wasn't qualified for, the blessing of his brother. He disguised himself. He knows that if I appear as Jacob and I go to Esau, I don't think Esau, uh, I go to Jacob, <laughs> I go to Isaac, my father, I don't think he will give me the blessing. So the best thing is that let me appear to be somebody else. You know that people that want something, they say, if I go with my original self, I don't think I will get it. If I go with my CV like this, I, so they pretend to be somebody that they're not. There are even people that write fake things on the CV, fake company, the company they have not worked for. It's in this country that I found out that somebody will say, hey, you know what? I will do your reference, you do my reference. We're both looking for a job together. I will do your reference, you do my reference. So let's write, just write this company down. I put this address. So when they send it, I will, write, I will write the reference for you. And when they send back to you, you write the reference for me. I say, what kind of few things are people doing in this country? So you see, so Jacob, he, he, he pretended, you know, he put a very elaborate disguise on. He put a goat here on his body so that his body can be hairy. 
He put on Esau's clothes so that he can appear, he can get the spell of Esau. But you see, those type of blessings, think about it. Now, let me tell you the repercussion. If you go to Genesis chapter 29, from verse 16 to 18, the same thing he did, they did it to him. And it was very painful. Just as it was painful for his brother. You know what happened? He, he, he labored for several years because he wanted to marry a, 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 a pretty girl whose name was Rachel. And then the night when they were presenting, they say, you've, you've paid for the girl. This is your wife. They brought her in the dark into the tent. It was not the girl, it was her sister. <laughs> You see, and then he woke up with the boy, having slept with her. He said, Hey, behold, it was Leah. He put his hand on his head. Isn't that what you did for your father? Isn't that what you did? So the same thing pretends it's not good. You write down 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 8. That's Saul before the witch of Endor. He, put, he disguised, saw the king disguise himself. Because, you know, if I go to the witch of Endor, she will not answer because he has killed all the witches and this witch was able to hide. But now God has, he has departed from God. God has departed from, he wanted somebody to tell him the, the, the truth, uh, the, the future. He went to this person, but he disguised himself. In uh, First Kings chapter 22, verse 30, Ahab disguised himself. He disguised himself as somebody else, and he went into battle. In 2 Chronicles chapter 35, from verse 21 and 22, Josiah disguised himself. 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verse 21 and verse 22. What happened? He said, I want to go and fight. I just want to go and fight. I want to go and fight that other king. Even the king that was going to fight, he said, I don't have any fight with you. I don't want to fight you. Don't do, let's not do this thing. You know what Josiah went to go and do? He went to go and disguise himself to fight that fight. And he died. He was struck in that battle. He went to go and die at least in his house. So I pray we will not be stubborn like this in Jesus' name. The place that says, don't go, don't go. You say, okay, since they are looking out to see if I'm going, then let me, disguise, let me put on face cap and put on dark shade and put on big, so I don't know I'm the person that went there. And then David disguised himself. He disguised his behavior when he was before Achish the Philistine in Gath. In 1 Samuel chapter 21, from verse 11 to verse 13. Amen. What are the lessons we can get from this? Some people feel that they can put on a disguise to get a miracle, a blessing, or to get prayed for or counseling. It's called tempting God. Some other people feel that they can put on a disguise to escape judgment, like Ahab, because he was going to the battle. They told him that if you go to that battle, you are going to die. You know what this man did? He put on a disguise. And then he told, that's why we, need, we shouldn't be naive. He told the, uh, Jehoshaphat, who was like his brother king from the Jordan nation. He said, you dress like a king, I will dress like a normal soldier. You know why? Because people were after the king. And this man, he thought that Ahab was his brother. And Ahab was thinking that, take my death and die it, and I will go free. <laughs> I pray. We will not we'll be wise as serpent and harmless as dove in Jesus' name. So some people put on a, feel that they can put on a disguise to escape judgment. If the judgment is coming from God, how can you put on a disguise to escape judgment? Some people feel that if they wear a disguise, God does not know that it is them like Josiah. Some people put on a disguise to take somebody else's blessing like Jacob and Leah. And then some people, you know, they, they want to get a blessing for, through a man of God, pray for me, pray for me, without taking off their disguise. When you come, the, the easiest way to get blessing is just take off your disguise and then let us see. If you go to the doctor with disguise, how are they going to prescribe the right thing for you? You come for counseling, you put on disguise. You only tell us half of the story, even one-tenth of the story. And you think that the counselor is going to be good counseling? Well, if we use our human understanding and experience, it won't be good because we don't have the whole story. 
If you go to a doctor, you say, this place is paying me, and you don't tell the history and why it is paying, what you did that is paying, they will just give you ointment, but there's another internal something there. And some people, when they come, if we use our own human understanding, you get wrong input, wrong input, wrong output. You give us wrong information, you get wrong counsel, and then don't come back and complain. But when God intervenes and God says, don't listen to what she's saying, don't listen to what I'm saying, this is it. Then sometimes it comes with judgment as well, because you've not been straightforward. So that's what we need to learn. Take off your disguise, whether in the church, it's not a place for disguise. Take off your disguise. There is no blessing without honesty. Just so there's no blessing without honesty. There's no blessing without honesty. Praise the Lord. Now let's move on. So we have something else. And now we've looked at Jeroboam. <clears throat> In this chapter here, that Jeroboam died, actually. This is the chapter where he died. In fact, it's the chapter where both of them died. Rehoboam died and Jeroboam died. We see the end here. Now, if you read here, you think that he died to say, but when you go and read Chronicles, God struck him and he died. So, that is, and with the judgment that he got, with his child dying, it didn't change. With what his wife came back and told him, he didn't change. God says, I'm not happy. I'm not happy with, you know, everything that you've done. He just died like that. He didn't make any amends through his life. I pray that the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Somebody says off, he says that uh, Saul was a bad man and a bad king. And uh, Saul was a bad man and a bad king. Um, Solomon was a good king and a bad man. But Jeroboam, he trumps them all. <laughs> he can't say, he can't say, he's not a good king, he's not a good man is the worst of them, or he set a new standard in badness. So everyone that came after him, God says, he did, his sin was like the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He set it, he, he sinned past the market scheme, that you have to throw away the market scheme and then use his own as he do. Praise the Lord. I pray we'll not be like that in Jesus' name. Now let's look at the other part. So we won't have time to go to the fall of Jeroboam. As you see it in this chapter, but well, you see something here. Let's pick something out. Remember looking at the danger of cover-up in the life of a Christian. Now, as you look at the last, the other part of the chapter, is talking about Rehoboam from verse 21. The son of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. He was 41 years when he began to reign. He reigned 17 years. And his mother's name was Nehemiah the Ammonites. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that the fathers had done. And they built high places and images and groves. And you say, why? Well, so it, we can blame Solomon. David, pure religion. No. In fact, even Saul, in the time of Saul, when things were good with Saul, he drove away all those witches. He, killed, he, he persecuted them, killed some of them, that they went into hiding. In the end of his life, he went to go and look for them. In the time of David, David never deviated to witch, to occultism, to uh, idol worship, no. Then Solomon. When you look at Solomon, the first wife from Egypt, the son and daughter of Pharaoh, he married the daughter, all these princesses, even the mother of Rehoboam was an Ammonite. Then he built all these high places for them. And then towards the end of his, when he left, people were very unhappy because he had overlabored his people. He had overlabored his people. In not only building the temple, then building his own house, and then building all these palaces, uh, places for these wives. But Robert, you say, what, well, what can we expect from, well, we could expect better. We can't just say because father was bad, mother was bad, then, Child, no, you, you should be able to learn. You are 41 years old. Look at how your grandfather lived. Look at how your father, uh, what your, look at the, the, the nation, the discontent of the nation. I do something that will be better, that will keep the nation together. No, he has lost more than half of the nation. 
And then they are, in, in his own time, they're building high places and images and grooves on every high hill. That's in First King, uh, First Kings chapter 14, verse 23. And there were also Sodomites in the land, this temple prostitution, male prostitutes. And they did according to all the abominations of the nation in his own time. Now in verse 25, and it came to pass in the fifth year of Rehoboam that Shishak, the king of Egypt, came against Jerobo, uh, Jerusalem. Now this is key. Watch out for this. It's very important. In verse 26, and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord. I've said this before, and let me repeat it. When a person turns their back to God, God turns his back to everything that they have dedicated to him. If the person has built a church, the person turns his back to God, God turns his back against that church. Whether it's vehicle, whether it's gold or whatever, it has no because God says, my son, give me your heart. It's your heart I want. He say, no, God, I will not give you my heart. I'll give you money. God says, that money, I despise it. We have beautiful buildings around us, churches, that they turn their back to the Lord. Those churches now have become what? Some of them have become, uh, um, uh, they become temples for other religion. I say, how can God let the building that was built for him and dedicated to him now be used as a temple for another God? God says, they turn their back to me, I turn their back to the building. You know, last week I was in Farnborough, I was going, I passed through Wimbledon, and, you know, when I was waiting for my train, because I had a long way for my train, about 40, <laughs> so let me walk around that Wimbledon area. I saw something. You see, when in the shopping center, you go to the, the side of that road, then you see inside the shopping center, then a church style. You see the building of a church. It must be a church because it's built out of stones, you know, not the way they build brick now, stones. They put stones, you see, you know these old churches like uh, Dolage, it was built out of stones. <clears throat> and then you go around the back, you see stained glass, the stained glass is still there. But you know what I found? I saw the, I saw the, um, I saw the signboard of Boots there, Boots Pharmacy. So what happens is that they've joined it to the uh, shopping center. So, so on one side, you will not know that it's a church, but it's only on, they, they maintain the outside world, the inside, the magic with the shopping center and they're selling stuff there. So you look at it, he, they took it, Shishak, the king of Egypt, took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. And he took away all, he took away all, and he took even away the shoes of gold, which so much made. Now there's a story behind those shoes. Now, Rehoboam made in the stead bracing shields, shields out of bronze, and he committed them to somebody. Now, there's something we have to learn from this. Now, you see those shields of gold that Solomon made? You will see it in 1 Kings chapter 10. <coughs> Excuse me. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 16 and 17. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 16 and 17 tells us the shields that Solomon made. Now, he made 500 shields. There were 200 of them were large. They're called targets. And 300 of them were small. They're called shields. Now, the target is big. It's, able, it's like a shield that's able to cover the whole body. So if you hold a target in front, it's like a full something. A shield is smaller. Now, you, and then he put them not in the, it wasn't for the temple. It was for his special house is called the house in the forest of Lebanon. It's one of his palaces. The house of the forest of Lebanon. Now, this, <coughs> these shoes themselves, you say, why did even Solomon you build these shoes? Now, before I tell you how he built, why he built these shoes, what is the cost of these shoes? The amount of gold that is used to make the shield is written in those in that first list of chapter 10. Somebody did, now yourself, you can value it because it says this is the number of pounds or weight of gold, pounds. So you know how much is an ounce of gold, how much is, will be a pound, how many ounces are in a pound, you can work it out yourself. But several years ago, somebody did costing and they said each large shield is worth about $120,000. And the smaller shields are each worth about $30,000, and he made, he made 200 of the large ones, 
and 300 of the small ones. So as at that time when they did this costing, that's 33 million in, in, in shields. Now what were, what were these shields? They were just decorated. They were just hung on the walls of that place. You're saying, Solomon, the fact that gold is common in, in, uh, in, in Jerusalem doesn't mean that you have to be spending all this money on these things just for decoration. Now you say, go, when you look at shoes, golden shoes are useless. Why? Because gold is too heavy to carry into battle. And it's too soft if somebody is throwing something at you. So they don't make goals out of, the goals for the uh, battlefield, they make them out of iron. They don't make them out of gold. But because there was so much money, is is they built temple, they built everything. They say, what else can we use this money for? It's just, it's, the gold is just, uh, what can we do? Okay, let's, oh, I like the idea of shoes. Okay, let's pick 500 of them and put them up. And now all these shoes are now ended up in the hand of the king of Egypt. 33 million worth of shoes. <laughs> Excuse me. So what lesson do we have to learn from this? My brethren, the fact that God is blessing you and the money is there doesn't mean you should just be spending it on anything. Praise the Lord. There are a lot of things you can spend money for. Remember after Solomon left, what did the people do? They came to come and complain. They said things have been tough on us. Jerusalem, good, everything might be good here, but we that are up north, we are suffering. You make us labor and build and build and build, and then you tax us so much. Why? To be putting shield in your palace? So the fact, my brethren, watch out. You see, in the time of, the time of uh, adversity, it needs prayer. Or the time of prosperity, people think that, oh, God has answered my prayer now. Now I have papers. I can work as I like. I can do any job I like. I can go back to university and get a good job. That is when people begin to let down their guard. The people that used to pray, they never miss Friday prayer meeting. They never miss an opportunity to fast before. Husband and wives that used to be very united before. When things were tough, when they were in a small apartment, they couldn't afford this and that. They didn't even have papers. They were united. Now papers have come. You see the two of them begin to fight. Why? Because too much money. All this money, what should we do? Let us buy shoes. We did. No, we shouldn't buy shoes. We should go and buy another uh, Rolls Royce. No, uh, you want to buy, me, I like Bentley. You like this one. They are fighting on which kind of car to buy. When you didn't have money, you were not fighting. But when now you have money, you are fighting. I pray that the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. People that were united, pray, honey, are you eating? No, no food today. All of the family were fast. You know, now that there's money, you know, before you talk two sentences, they say, ah, let's divorce. Let's divorce. You go your way. I go my way. I'm tired. You were not tired when there was trouble. So that's the lesson we learned. Solomon, you don't have to be doing these things. <clears throat> now, there's another lesson we're learning here. When the king of Egypt came to pack these 500 shoes away, you know what Rehoboam did? He went to go and make the same thing out of bronze. He went to go and make the same thing out of bronze. Now, let me show you something about Solomon's reign. In Solomon's reign, God so much blessed the people. God, God, but I, I don't think the development uh, went around. I don't think the development went around. Because the Bible tells us that at the time of Solomon, that there was so, look at in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 27. So I want you to see the contrast from the time of David to the time of Rehoboam, how things have changed. How things have changed. In the time of David, things were good because David put together a lot of that gold. He collected that gold. He said, Solomon, I'm not going to build this temple, but you, my son, are going to build the temple. I don't want you to stress, so let me gather materials for you. When Solomon, God gave him wisdom, God said, I'll give you wisdom, riches. God was sending gold even to, uh, into Israel. That from nations, they were just, he was just getting... Blessings from everywhere. 
Now look at the situation in Jerusalem in the time of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 27. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 27. And the Lord made, and the king made silver, this Solomon, he made silver to be in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem as what? They were as common as so nobody reckoned for silver. You know, you bring silver, it's like, what are you bringing? We do with gold in this place. That's how rich they were. God makes, the silver were like stones. You bring silver, nobody's going to respect it. Now, Solomon's son, he, they lost all those things. He's not going to reflect and ask, why are the riches of the nation gone? Why are the riches of my forefathers gone? In the time of my father, ah, gold was so common here that silver was not counted with. He wasn't a boy then. He was 41 years old when he took over. Silver was not in now. He's not even going to make these things out of silver. He's going to make them out of bronze. He's going to make them out of bronze. Then, after he makes them out of bronze, he's just going to put it there like a show. Why? So that people will not know that we have lost the gold. Let's just put something there. Let's pretend as if it's gold. Let's act. The, the secret that everybody knows, let's pretend as if they have not come to carry it away. You know, there are people like that. You've lost gold. If you've lost gold, cry for the gold. Ask God, God, why did I lose this gold? God, can you give me this gold back? If I repent, will you give it back to me? No. You know what they do? They just kind of make bronze. They, put, they, they pretend, they cover up. They go and put salt. Provided people think that is gold, I'm happy. Are you like that? Provided people think that we are okay, I'm happy. Provided people think that, I'm not, think that I'm not, even though I'm suffering, provided people think that I'm not suffering, it's happy. I'm happy. Provide, there's no peace in the family. Provided people think that there's peace, I'm happy. Let's go, when we're going to church, let's just go and put on a show for them in the church. Let's just hold our hand. I don't care what you throw at me when we get home. Whether you throw words or you throw plate or whatever you throw at me, throw it. But keep my respect in the church. Is that like you? So you've lost gold. Cry for that gold. Ask God, God, where is the gold gone? Where is the gold gone? In my family, where that gold that we had, where has it gone? But they, without even splitting it, a second thought, you just go and make bronze, you put it there. So when people come in, they see bronze. I think that is, are you pretend as if it's gold? Ah, this, your shield is looking very nice. Ah, it's nice. You see, it's exactly, can you not see it's exactly the same as it's been here for a long time? Who are you deceiving? Now, he made all those shoes of bronze. He put it in those, he put it in, in, in that place. But there's something more here. You see, Solomon put his own out. In fact, some people tell us that it was on the outside of the building. He put it there. And nobody can come and steal it. That's the protection of God. In Jeroboam's days, they saw it, they came to take it away. Now, Jeroboam, when he makes his own bronze, He's not even going to put it out again. Can you see how, how things have changed? He's not even going to put it out. Look at what he did. It's there. Uh, as we're rounding up. So in verse 27, <clears throat> and Jeroboam made in their stead brazen shields and committed them into the hands of the chief of the guards who kept them at the, in the door of the king's house. Who, who kept, which kept the door of the king's house. So give, he put them under special security. And it was so when the king went to the house of the Lord that the guard bear them and brought them, in, and, and brought them back into the guard chamber. So the shields are no longer out. He put them in the guard chamber. He said, look, and then he put the chief security man. He said, please, this is, our, this is very precious to us. <laughs> keep, it, keep it for us. Keep it for us. Why? So that this bronze must not go. And when people see us, we must have something to show them. So keep it very carefully. Can, can you see the change between the days of Solomon and the days of Rehoboam? But even so, there's no reflection. There's no, why are things going wrong? 
Why are we losing more and more? This big loss, 33 million, just went like that. What have you lost in your family? Maybe your own is not even up to 33 million. You lost, even if it's 30,000 you lost, are you not going to ask, why did we lose this 30,000? Even if it is 5,000, why did we lose it? God, have mercy. What, what happened to us? I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. So today we've looked at the danger of cover-up in the life of a Christian. I've looked at many things. We've looked at Jeroboam. We looked at Jeroboam's wife. You know, we've applied it to our own lives today. We've seen how God was very specific with Jeroboam and said, this is what you have done wrong. This is why judgment is coming. And if you are there, you always feel God is not happy. I'm not happy with myself. You know, I don't have assurance of salvation. Because, and we say, what have you done? I don't, I'm not doing anything wrong. Not that I'm committing fornication, I don't throw anything. But I just know that I am not good enough. So what, what good is good enough? But doesn't the Bible say that God loves you? God, doesn't the Bible say that God has forgiven you? God has accepted you as you are. Yes, but even though I still feel this and that. So we've seen that we've seen the attitude of Jeroboam's wife. We've seen also Rehoboam and his own attitude towards things. I will sum it all up to say God wants his people to be straightforward. Now, let's look at this as we go to God in prayer. I said before, there's no blessing without honesty. The antidote or the lesson we have to learn, a few things. Number one, be genuine. Tell somebody be genuine. Be genuine. Number two, be authentic. Be transparent. You say, let people see, be transparent like glass. If inside is not good, let, what are you for? What are, see, if I'm, my inside is not good, see it. I don't care because you know what? God sees it. So I don't care. What am I getting from you? So be transparent. Jeroboam's wife, be transparent. You get there. Jeroboam, be transparent. Rehoboam, be transparent. What you have, let's know you have it. The one you, you've lost, let's know that you've lost. So I, let the whole nation cry for it, that we've lost it. Be open. You see, be, be open and open. That's, that's the nature of the Christian, be open. If there's problem, particularly when you come to the man of God, you say, look, there is problem. Look, we're not suffering and smiling here. There is, but it's not good now, but we want it to be good. And then, where you have messed up, own up. Jerubam, just own up. I say, look, I've messed up. I'm owning up to it. Please, Ahija, what can you do for us? And then, not only that, don't just own up. Where you've messed up, clean up. Tell somebody, clean up. Amen. Clean up. All the things you've done wrong, even though you've led the whole nation to idol worship, you know you can still clean it up. It's possible. You are the one that took them to idol worship. You can clean it up. You can go and break down that golden calf you put in that place. Break that one down, break that one down. Say, look, I, I did wrong. I made a mistake. God has shown me, please, everybody, it is God. Let us cry out unto God. Where you have messed up, own up, and then clean up. My brethren, honesty is the best policy. Let's take this to the Lord in prayer. Let's rise upon our feet, please. The danger of cover-up in the life of a Christian when you make, even, even at work, when you make mistakes, you know, even the people that are not Christians in your office, they, they value it when you, when you are straightforward, when you own up and say, look, the report I wrote, wrote I now see that there it was a mistake in it. They value that one. The medication I gave, there it was a mistake in it. Don't just pretend as if it didn't happen. I want you to own up. When you have messed up, people want you to own up, and then they want you to clean up. What I've observed is that when they know that you already know your mistake, then they don't talk much. It's when they know that you, they think you don't know your mistake, then they try and convince you that do you know that this thing you've done is wrong? Do you still wear disguises? You double yourself up. You create another version of yourself that people will like. 
that people will favor, that people will bless. You create another version of yourself with a disguise on. God is calling us today to be straightforward Christians. They say, what is your name? I am Jeroboam's wife. It's me, prophet, please. Don't lock the door on me. I've come. I'm your daughter. Please, it's me. It's me. Don't be angry. We know where we, what we have done wrong. Who are you? It's Jacob. I'm Jacob. I just say I should come, Daddy. I need this blessing. Mom told me that this is what God said. I'm the one who's going to get the blessing. Who are you? My name is Leah. Me too, I want to marry, but it's not like snatching my sister's husband that I'm going to marry. It's not by snatching her husband. It is me. You know, that Leah, she kept her mouth quiet throughout the whole night so that they would not know that she's the one. She pretended as if she's her sister until the morning came because they have coached her. They said, look, just act as if you are your sister. You will not know. You woman of Tekoa, who are you? It's me. I just came to talk to you. I'm a wise woman. I just say, is it not, it will not be good if you kill uh, Absalom. Or, but this is who I am. Joab said I should come and lie this way. I'm not going to lie. Let me tell you the truth, King. This is what I think. And another son Sapphira, what happened? We sold it for this much. This is what we can afford to give. God bless you. Ahab, why do you want somebody to take your debt? He said, if I disguise myself, God will not see me, that I'm the one he wants to kill in this battle. So Jeroboam, you, 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 <laughs> you act as the king. I will act as your servant. But you know that arrow still got to him. The arrow of God never misses. The arrow still got to the person that was in disguise. The arrow of God still got to Jeroboam's wife in disguise. The arrow of God still got to Adonis and Sapphira in disguise. My brother and my sister, are you more concerned about what people will say? Whether there's shield of gold in our house or there's no shield of gold in our house, that's what you are concerned about. Not what you have lost, not what is missing. You say, I don't care what is missing, provided they don't know that it is missing. If you've lost gold, big gold, cry for that gold you have lost. Let people know that you've lost it. Go, let them cry with you. Let them counsel you. What you can do to get it back. Don't just go and make bronze and then put it there. To deceive us. Provided they think there's bronze, provided they think there's something there, I don't mind. I don't mind. Provided they think, provided they think I'm rich. People are like that. Or why they think I'm not suffering? I don't care. Let me be suffering. Let me be doing morning to night in UK. Providing my family back home think that I'm rich. So when I'm sending the picture, I go and stand by somebody's car. Rolls Royce, I take the picture. So I think when I see a fine house, I go and stand beside it. I take picture. So I let them think that it is, I'm the one. It doesn't matter what my reality is, provided they think they respect me. What type of life is that one? In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you because of your word that you sent to us today. You are saying that we should be unpretentious Christians. We should be straightforward Christians. We should be honest Christians. We should be Christians.
says that we don't care what people think about us. We care about what you think about us. We should be Christians that when we've messed up, we should own up and then we should clean up. Lord, you've told us today that honesty is the best policy. Lord, we're praying that as we've heard all this, transform us from the inside out in Jesus' name. Amen. That we will not have a name that we live and that we are dead in Jesus' name. Some people pass by, they say, oh, those church, they dress well, they, 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 they look well, they smile at each other, but it's just for sure. We don't want our lives to be for sure. Lord, in the name of Jesus, help us that we will be the, the real thing, the genuine thing in Jesus' name. We don't want to be gold-plated. We want to be solid gold. You see, people, so people are happy to be gold-plated. Let's put one, like a, a, a tenth of an inch of gold on the outside, but inside is iron. Inside is another material. But when people see it on the outside, they'll say, oh, gold, gold. Lord, we want it to be so When you cut us through, right to the very core of our being, we are gold from the outside, even to the inside in Jesus' name. Amen. And we don't care what people think about us. We thank you, Lord, because we believe you've answered. Bless us all, each and every one of us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God.